everybody, I'm so thrilled. We have uh, in the spotlight, Dr. Damian Brady. He is a professor of oceanography at the University of Maine at Orono. And he's gonna be sharing his knowledge with us about offshore wind. So Damian, take it away. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, uh, I guess I'll start by sharing my screen. And doing the requisite, can everyone see my screen? Um, okay, good. Um, so hello everyone, uh, I'm Damian Brady. I am, uh, as um, Suzanne mentioned, I'm in the School of Marine Sciences at the University of Maine. Um, and uh, I do a lot of coastal oceanography work, but for the past 13 years or so, I've been leading environmental monitoring efforts for the University of Maine's offshore wind program, floating offshore wind program. Um, yeah, currently right now I'm, I'm sitting on the Governor's Energy Office uh, Research Consortium uh, um, uh, into effects of offshore wind, um, and in particular floating offshore wind, which what is, which is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to sort of answer questions as we go along. So if you want to put them in the chat, as Suzanne said, I, I can answer them in the middle, or we can have sort of a conversation uh, um, toward the end. So, um, and, you know, in some ways it's been a very easy job since there's not a lot of floating offshore wind in the water. Um, so there's been a lot of planning and discussions and I'll talk about our 2013, 2014 deployment and then what the uh, what the future holds for this. So um, I, I always like to start with sort of the why, um, why we're interested in developing floating offshore wind assets, um, particularly in the Gulf of Maine. Um, uh, this is a, a figure from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Shout out to Janet Duffy Anderson, who's on here from GMRI. Um, and, you know, what I really like about this figure, among other things, right, it sort of underscores our problem, um, uh, you know, quite well. But I think the one thing it highlights that people probably don't generally recognize is that in many ways, rather than this continuous warming trend, what we've had is a step change. It's a regime shift. Um, you know, you can sort of look at this line and you can watch us bounce around between 14 and 15 degrees C for a long, long time. And then around 2008, we move into this whole other regime, right? So it hasn't been this slow, continuous warming, um, you know, that we're on this trajectory for. In many ways, we've made a step change. And, and actually, if you sort of look at the step change uh, at, four, you know, let's call it 14 and a half degrees to 16 degrees you sort of see that we've already done the 1.5 degree C jump that the IPC is afraid of, right? So we, we've we done that, um, we did that starting in 2008, and now we bounce around this sort of new normal. And I think it begs the question, uh, a lot, among a lots of other questions, is what role does the Gulf of Maine have in helping to fix this problem, right? And the generation of a lot of um, renewable energy certainly would seem to be on the table. So that that's a little bit of just sort of why, as even as an oceanographer, I'm even doing this because uh, I've been just super interested in rather than documenting all this change and saying, gosh, isn't this um, terrible? I, I was kind of interested in what these climate solutions might look like. Um, I love this figure from NOAA uh, or this movie, and I hope everyone can see it, but it really explains why we've undergone this step change. You'll see the arrow moving up as the North Atlantic current or the extension of the Gulf Stream, um, and that divides the Atlantic Ocean or North Atlantic Ocean. We see a secondary current called the Erminger Current that moves around Greenland. There's a lot of uh, ice melt from the Arctic and Greenland, and so the next thing that you'll see is the Labrador. And this is causing this uh, gyre um, uh, and that gyre right there, when it gets accelerated, less cold water from the north makes its way down here to the Gulf of Maine, where I'm sort of where my cursor is. And so as more ice has melted, as well as the strength of the Gulf Stream causing uh, sea surface height um, right here at a, a place called the tail of the Grand Banks, that has led to less of this Labrador current water that used to fuel the Gulf of Maine. And it makes us fundamentally different than the rest of the East Coast. Our water is coming from the North and then making its way South. Um, whereas most of the rest of the East Coast South of Cape Cod is a lot of Gulf Stream water moving South to North. Um, and that has sort of made us susceptible to step changes because the less of this Labrador current water that makes its way into the Gulf of Maine, 
um, the more it's easy for us to make this step change and then stay in the step change. And we have a lot of deep questions about what the future holds for the Gulf of Maine. Do we just bounce around this new normal for quite some time or do or are there other step and big changes in the future? And that's a that's a huge, huge question for us for us to answer. This is sort of just a, a graphic or an encapsulation because I think a lot of people say, well, why are we warming faster than 99% of the world's ocean? And, you know, I, I just want to stress that because we're a, we're like a kiddie pool with two hoses going into it, the Labrador slope water and, and to some extent a little bit the Gulf Stream and the more water that uh, in this case right here at the tail of the Grand Banks, the less of this Labrador uh, slope water that makes its way into the Gulf of Maine, the warmer it is. And the warmer that uh, um, the Gulf of Maine is, the worse that is for things like Calanus, that North Atlantic right whales and juvenile lobster feed on, um, and, and a lot of other processes that we care a lot about. <laughs> So the reason I bring it this up is because there is a, uh, let's put it this way, that there is a real fundamental tension in our state around um, fisheries that are so clearly affected by the climate change that I'm discussing. Let's say our Atlantic cod fishery doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, Northern shrimp, Pangelus borealis, we don't, you know, we don't fish for that anymore either. And these are sort of pretty well-documented instances of climate impacts on fisheries. Um, and we have uh, you know, a north and um, eastward shift in, uh, in American lobster. But then if we want to put floating offshore wind in the water, oftentimes the first, uh, the first people that will be impacted potentially by some of these development projects are some of those similar heritage industries. And we see a lot of pushback um, on a lot of this. So here's just two that I'm bringing up here. But uh, it, it is very convenient that we have a governor named Mills, so crush the mills, you know, but you could refer to windmills and you could refer to Janet Mills. And so there was um, some protests there. Um, one of the potential sites of constructing these facilities in Sears, uh, near Sears Island, for instance. And so um, there's, you know, petitions to not have construction facilities there. So there is this dichotomy or this tension in the state around generating climate solutions and then those climate solutions themselves may impact you know either environments or fisheries um, and that's a problem uh, for lots of different reasons but certainly from a fisheries perspective you know two years ago the American lobster fishery was our number one export it was worth 730 million dollars to the state um, it's a huge huge piece of our economy and our culture um, so it can't be ignored that the, um, as we try to develop climate solutions, you know, we have to do it in a way that coexists with some of these heritage industries. Oh, here's another uh, example of crush mills um, that has been taking place. Um, so what does this technology look like? Um, the UMaine technology that uh, that I've been working with the team of engineers up here and exploring is called Volturnus, um, Roman god for wind. Um, this is what that looks like. This is a one eighth scale turbine uh, deployment. So it's about an eighth of the um, scale of the large turbine. Uh, and the idea here is that in around 100 meters of water, so 300 feet of water, you can't do monopile fixed anymore. So the way they're doing offshore wind south of Cape Cod, for instance, right now, or Block Island in Rhode Island, if we're familiar, is what we call a monopile fixed offshore wind. In the Gulf of Maine, we're going to have to use floating. And I'd be happy to have lots of conversations about that because in some ways the Gulf of Maine are the, the, the test runs for California where the water gets much, much deeper, much, much faster. And in fact, two leases went up for sale last year in California, Morro Bay and Humboldt. They all sold for really high prices and those are in a thousand meters of water. So 3000 feet of water. And so that's really where floating is going to be necessary. We're never going to have steel monopile fixed in, in a lot of these areas. Our technology at the University of Maine helped develop by Habib Dogger and Anthony Vaselli and the engineers up on campus. By the way, I'm at the Darling Marine Center, uh, if you ever need to um, swing by and visit. Um, and those engineers up in Orono, they've been using this Volturnus design because it's made out of concrete and concrete could be made in Maine. So all the components other than the turbine sold by large turbine manufacturers like Siemens and Gomesa could actually be constructed here in the state. And that was actually a big part of the power purchase agreement for some of the projects that I'm going to talk. Uses ultra lightweight composite tower on an existing turbine. It's designed for a mass production and potentially 100 year life cycles. The potential advantage of floating is that when the turbine is done with its life, let's say in 20 or 25 years, you tow the entire platform back to 
um, a shore-based facility, you put a new turbine on it, and then you tow it back out to that facility. Whereas right now with Monopile, you have to actually put the turbine up on the top of the tower at sea, depending on what the conditions look like, that can be um, problematic. So uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit because it's sort of a confusing array of things that are happening in the state. And so Volturnus US was the first grid connected floating offshore wind turbine in the US that was deployed in 2013 and 2014 in Castine, Maine. Uh, we did a lot of monitoring of that project. I'm going to show um, some of that material um, right now. That's what that turbine looked like. So just to put it in perspective, smaller than this sailboat that was sailing by. Um, we had the benefit of actually deploying a camera um, on a property that was adjacent to it. Uh, a gentleman named Bill Light, an electrical engineer who was very supportive of the project, allowed us to install that. And we took video of the turbine um, throughout its time out there. And so this is one of the images that one of the students captured of a sailboat moving by, but it just gives you a sense of the scale. Then there's a proposed project called New England Aquaventus 1, and that's one commercial scale turbine, 11.4 megawatts to be deployed off of Monhegan Island. To put this in perspective, probably the biggest land-based turbine most people have seen in New England is probably around three megawatts. So this is about four times bigger. So part of the advantage of offshore uh, wind installations is the ability to put very, very large turbines that generate a lot of electricity on each unit. And you sort of have to because each one you install is very, very expensive, but there's really nothing blocking the wind over long periods of, uh, uh, or long areas of space. So there's really long fetch lengths and, and very, very consistent wind resource that um, offshore wind turbines can take advantage of. So I'll talk a little bit about that project off of Monhegan Island. I'm always happy to talk about that one because that one is the one that's sort of been going on, I'd say the longest over the 13 years that I've been engaged in this. So here's what that one looks like. Uh, you can see that it's about 200 meters or 657 feet from the waterline to the top of the top, you know, the highest blade or 412 feet from the waterline up to the turbine. Um, these are large. There's no other way of sort of of putting that. These are really, really, really big uh, um, turbines, and and that's uh, you know because you're at 11.4 megawatt capacity. Um, and then they're on floating foundations. If you look at the top view, it's pretty useful because later on I'm going to talk about pie wedges. And when I say pie wedges, I mean these pylons. They are anchored down to the seabed in three locations. And that there are these sort of pie wedges in between these areas. And, and we've been asking questions about, are those going to be, let's say, off limits to fishing? And can you fish in those areas? Can you deploy aquaculture and other things in those kinds of areas too? And then finally, there's the research array. Uh, my slide's probably a little outdated. It's probably almost certainly going to be 10 turbines, not 12. They would be 15 megawatts e uh, a piece. They actually don't get much bigger. They just start to get rated to 15 megawatts. That means the electricity generation by the turbine is consistently able to generate 15 megawatts at, at optimal or peak wind resources. Um, so the turbines are getting much more efficient without having to get a lot bigger. Um, uh, and that is for a location now that's been set, that's 30 miles due east of Portland. Um, and I said here, pending a BOEM application from the state, but I will say that the state has been accepted as an applicant for that project. And um, that is in the process of a power purchase agreement between the Public Utility Commission and the um, developer doing that project called PTAU, the Pine Tree Offshore Wind, PTAU. Um, and that that's an ongoing um, project. It'll be, certainly be the first of its kind. We call it a research array because the idea here is that we're sort of crawling before we walk. And if Monhegan is walking before we run, the research array is jogging before we, we really run because this is not really a commercial scale project, but 10, 15 megawatt turbines would, would power thousands of homes. So it's not nothing. That's what this project would look like. Here's a schematic of what it potentially looks like. Each of the turbines that I showed before for Monhegan would be placed about one nautical mile to two nautical miles apart. Uh, I think it's important to sort of get a sense of what these projects potentially really look like. They, um, there's quite a bit of space, right? There's one to two nautical mile squared uh, in between these turbines, right? And so we've we've had a lot of deep questions on the research consortium side, as well as during the governor's task force to uh, to look at these projects to, to ask what is the possibility of coexistence or co-location? Do fishermen want these close together? 
Um, do they want them further apart with navigation lanes? So these are still some big open questions, but this is typically, or, or this is what we think the research array could look like um, in their Turpin's Zophy here to the right. Um, this is sort of a busy figure, uh, but I'll just highlight you know, one thing, because I think we've seen a huge amount of solar and certainly we've had lots of questions about, you know, why can't we just keep pushing solar to the maximum? And I think that, you know, when we look at the electrification focus scenarios for the future of New England, so here's a 2050 pro projection. Uh, and the scenario here is if we all focused on moving towards electricity that included heat pumps and electric cars, the question just becomes, how do we deal with peak demand? And it turns out because we live in Maine, the peak demand is going to be from heat pumps, um, which is not actually when solar generation will be at peak. And, and this is where we need 60, 000, potentially 60,000 megawatts of, of 2050 peak demand if we electrify our whole grid. Um, you know, we'll need to come in January. And January is actually a place where offshore wind will will excel, whereas solar will be will generate less production. So in some ways that we're we're trying to design transmission, delivery, and generation for a peak demand in New England if we were to all move to electrification, which we sort of, at least from a climate perspective, would be better, right? Um, as we move into the future. So this is sort of the design of uh, the future of our renewable infrastructure will need to have some offshore wind, or, or at least this is what is projected by, by some. So this is where that installed capacity, I'm just highlighting here that most of the projections, even if we get to half solar, which would be fantastic, and we generated 107 gigawatts in New England, we'd still need to bat a have a third of our sources from offshore wind for most of the projections that get us to electrification. So there's a lot on this slide, but I'm just sort of circling where our installed capacity may need to be. Okay, so that really begs a super important question is if we are going to generate a third of our electricity from offshore wind in New England writ large, um, how are we going to do it in such a way that we're gonna protect wildlife and heritage industries like fisheries um, and it's an extremely important question and a difficult question to, to uh, answer. Um, these kinds of systems uh, um, are in, in some ways in three different marine environments that we think about. Uh, the first is the marine air environment. So that includes birds and bats um, where we have to calculate the probabilities of collision and avoidance, um, displacement and attraction to these. Um, areas. Then there's the pelagic. When and I when I refer to pelagic, I'm going to mean the water column itself. Um, and then there's the benthic uh, and effects on the benthos. And this is sort of a, I think a pretty good way of of conceptualizing some of the ways that we are trying to uh, answer questions around the uh, um, the effect of these installations in these environments. And I and I should say that I I like to think that if I had a hundred dollars, the question for me is how much should I invest in collision or displacement or habitat change or noise or EMF, and then figure out which of these effects are more likely than others, and therefore I should spend more of my $100 on. Should I spend $80 on collision and, and uh, um, you know $10 on displacement and $5 on habitat change and $5 on noise and EMF? It's not a, it's not a, um, a single pie, but I've been, tr I, I've been thinking really hard about prioritizing which is often actually a really difficult conversation because I think everyone has a very different priority for what they think is the most important part of, uh, of this kind of monitoring. But I guess I'm just trying to give you a sense of the conversations that we've been having for, for quite some time when we think about these different effects. Um, I also want to you know, highlight that these are not easy projects. I mean, I think I read recently that we have enough renewable energy in the pipeline in the US if we could get them permitted to actually go to zero emissions. It's just that the pathway for these projects is really, really arduous and, and difficult. And, and I, I'm going to just you know, put down, these are just the permits required for the Monhegan project, which again is a one turbine project in state waters. Um, the most important of which is a GP or a general permit. Um, that's, you know, through consultation with the Department of Environmental Protection. There's NERPA, the Natural Resources Protection Act. Maine has a submerged lands program uh, where if you uh, cable and installation of the cable, really, really important for these projects. Um, Department of Maine Transport, uh, Department of Transportation has a utility location permit for the cable to shore. 
US Army Corps of Engineers regulates this through the River and Harbors Act, the Clean Water Act. Um, so does BOEM as a consulting agency. You have to go to FAA to approve your lighting um, and placement. Uh, there's the Endangered Species Act. Clearly in our neck of the woods, we have red knot and piping plover and North Atlantic right whale and Atlantic sturgeon and Atlantic salmon um, and Arctic tern that are all species that you need to consult with and get biological opinions on. NIMFS and U.S. Fish and Wildlife has Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act. NIMFS, of course, has the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So in addition to the Endangered Species Act with the North Atlantic right whale, there are potential effects to minkies or humpback whales um, that need to be accounted for in your permitting process. U.S. Coast Guard, of course. Uh, navigation, private aids and navigation, main department of ag conservation forestry at the coastal zone management. And of course, the main historic preservation has a really big say because the cable requires a magnetometer survey all down all through the cable route because you can't be impacting shipwrecks, for instance. And this is just a slice of the consultations because I haven't included the Department of Defense, which has a huge say in where these projects um, end up going, uh, as well as tribes and um, tribal sovereignty issues that are that are um, added to this. So if I haven't made this seem complex enough to try to get up off the ground, I'd say most people then realize why we've been working on this 13 years and there still is really no offshore wind. In fact, there's only really five to seven turbines in the US, whereas just to put this in perspective, there are 5,500 offshore wind turbines in Europe right now. So this is these complex logistics of these three habitats. And I think I'm going to just talk a little bit about the European example because I referenced it. But with 5,500 turbines um, in Europe, this is even like a, a good time to, to think about what are the lessons we're starting to learn there. This is probably, I would say, by far the project that we have the most to learn from. This is a project called High Wind Scotland by a company called Equinor. It is really the, the biggest, uh, largest scale um, comparison we have for a floating project. This uh, conceptual diagram sort of shows you what these five turbines look like. Here's each turbine. Each of these turbines has a mooring line, the same way we would have a mooring line. Each of these turbines has to be connected with a cable. And then each of those cables then needs to come to shore here in, uh, in Scotland. So this is probably the most interesting comparative example that we have to, uh, um, to look at. This is a spar design. Before you saw, we had a semi-submerged design that was on a, a tripod platform. In this case, the idea here is a little bit like the idea of an iceberg, is you have a tremendous amount of mass and um, uh, below the surface that is a counterweight for what's happening to the turbine up top. This is a spar design. It has a bridle um, and a mooring line down to uh, down to the bottom. This is going to be pretty close to what we what we try to do in the Gulf of Maine if we if we deploy that. Each of the connecting cables has a, a buoyancy adjuster, so it has a little S. So as the water goes up and down during storms, there's some give in the cable, and that's what this buoyancy is for. And then it goes down, gets buried in the sediment, gets connected to the next turbine. So this is what they call a dynamic configuration infield cable. And this is pretty similar to what we would do here in the Gulf of Maine to daisy chain, let's say the 10 turbine project I referenced before. I suspect that pretty much everything that we see in a northern temperate area like Scotland is going to be pretty close to what we see here. This is actual footage from that project of what we suspect will grow on it. And I want to underscore that, at least from a marine biological perspective, one of the most important and interesting aspects of this will be ecological interactions for me, because I think what we're going to see is something similar to this, that a lot of the subsurface is going to grow middleless, and almost anything in the subsurface that is near the light is also going to have some kind of kelp. So this is laminaria. We might have saccharina or sugar kelp. They have middleless. So this is substructure with middleless or blue mussels and laminaria. That's this um, kelp that you're seeing right here. I would be shocked if you put something in the water, and I've been putting a lot of buoys and aquaculture installations in the water that we didn't get a lot of this kind of growth. Um, there is uh, um, spinulosa and other um, uh, organisms here, um, uh, balanus, uh, tunicates, um, anemones, certainly on the chain um, here, uh, you know, they're seeing a lot of the same organisms. And the question is, is this, this is provide, certainly going to provide new habitat. Um, there's going to be prey for any fish species that's interested in eating mussels. There's going to be a lot more mussels in these areas. It's, there's going to be a level of attraction that certainly occurs. And 
you know, we're really, really interested in seeing what that looks like for a place like Monhegan and then potentially the main research array moving into the future. Here's another, I thought a really cool picture. This is that buoyancy cable. So that's the cable that comes down off the middle of the turbine. There's a little buoyancy on it. And that buoyancy is essentially what this, what it, what you're seeing here in terms of sea fans and enemies and other organisms growing on the, uh, on the turbine. Um, I probably, I, I, maybe I'll pause right here, Suzanne, because I think, you know, I'm sort of halfway in, but, and I, and I see some chat in there. So maybe Suzanne, if you've, if you've got some questions that, that you've been collating, I can try to answer those before moving on. Yeah. And I have a couple that were um, just sent to me. So um, a question, what is step change? You referred to that in the beginning. Yeah. So, um, or sometimes we'll call it a regime shift. So Instead of, uh, I, I think of the uh, the analogy or metaphor of the frog in the boiling water that if you you know throw a frog in the boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you leave it in and you slowly let it increase it, it doesn't jump out. And so what we've undergone in some ways is the first scenario, whereas we were bouncing around a certain temperature change. And then that Labrador slope water um, in some ways gets pinched at the tail of the Grand Banks. And now we bounce around a degree and a half higher than we used to. So in many ways, it happened over a short number of years, not over 20 years, but actually over three or four years, we experienced this change. It's not a coincidence that the lobster industry, you know, from 2008 to 2016, set every record. Every year was a new record because down East Maine, which actually wasn't a great place for settling lobsters, as of 2008, it had some of the highest lobster settlement we've ever seen. And then five, six, seven years later, those lobsters came to market. Um, so there have been aspects, right, where species will be climate winners. And that really occurred because of this really big, what I call a step change, which means a change that happened over a short period of time rather than a long period of time. Great. Um, next. Okay, there's a lot here. Uh, why are we even considering offshore wind? When did this gain momentum? Why aren't we staying with land wind? We are still learning and improving land-based wind. Jumping to offshore seems premature based on current technology. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's probably lots of different reasons, but most of the analyses, uh, you know, have us tapped out in terms of wind, certainly in Maine, onshore wind or what we call uh, um, hilltop or mountaintop wind um, generation. The, the fetch and therefore the wind resource in the offshore environment is much, much higher. So the ability to, to use 11 to 15 megawatt turbines per device is really not going to happen on land. Um, and we've made a huge transition um, already in this country, right, to renewable energy in places like Texas um, and, the, and the plains and other parts of the country. But certainly offshore wind is a, and right now um, necessary as we sort of saturate those places and we can generate a lot more electricity near, and I, I should, you know, stress near where the power load is. You know, we can't really generate offshore wind that makes its way to New York City or Boston. Um, you know, as of right now in the traditional places. So I think it's a really good argument that's ongoing. And, you know, the Department of Energy is making bets on offshore wind because um, you can get uh, a generation near where the power load is being consumed, um, in particular, as it relates to renewable energy, whereas before you had to, you know, ship in coal or oil at, at um, power, uh, power plants to, to get it there. But it's a great question. Um, the next one, do we have data from the test array about whether the artificial reef effect attracted and increased the number of fish in the area of the floating turbines? Yeah, so um, on the, the project I was showing at Highwind Scotland, if you read those environmental reports, it certainly appears that way. Uh, similarly, in the Netherlands, that there is an attraction, particularly of what we call demersal fish like cod. Um, to, you know, to having some structure in these areas, you know, what we'll find, you know, we've been trying to run uh, what we call bocce designs before, after control impact. We found that that was important in Rhode Island, for instance, because if you monitored the number of lobsters before and after that project, you might say the project caused a decline in lobsters, but clearly in the last eight years, the number of lobsters that are living in Rhode Island in general has gone down um, by, you know, by quite a bit. So we'll, we'll be looking for the same certainly the same things at the main research array and at Monhegan. Uh, 
Okay. Um, do you have many bats flying over the water? Uh, yeah, that that's been enlightening over my time here because I I spent a lot of time offshore and I don't think of this as being a really a bat intensive area. Um, and I think what has sort of happened, you know, we have this underlying thing uh, uh, called climate change that's making things like white nose and other um, diseases for bats much more prevalent and makes this fungi. Uh, you know, much more likely to spread. And so bats are becoming species of concerned or endangered at a pretty rapid rate. So even a small amount of bat activity is something that we have to be cognizant of. And there are increasingly, we put echo sounders out of buoys offshore. And yeah, you can, you can, it's much, much, much less active than it is in other areas. But where are there are insects and surface insects, there will be bats, right? And so that one of our questions has been things like intermittent lighting, you know, you have to just be careful about how much these things are lit from a navigation point of view, it's important, but from a wildlife point of view, it can be an attractant. Do you want to do, I have a bunch more, but do you want to do one more and then? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one says, not wanting to put you on the spot, but would you be prepared to share which potential stressor you would spend your hundred dollars on? Um, uh, thank you for putting me on the spot. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> that. And, and it's a really hard question. You know, my, my sense is the below water stuff in general is, could be potentially positive, uh, you know, in terms of generating habitat. Um, so do I want to spend my hundred dollars, you know, documenting what I assume will happen, which will be, you know, the formation of reforming species like middleus and therefore species that eat middleus and, and blue mussels, um, and then I know for sure from the European examples that I'm going to run into a lot of avoidance. I think birds generally avoid these areas and and fly around them. Uh, you know, most of my money would be on birds, uh, and 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 not because I have a concern about population level decreases. I you know I think we've all seen the document documents of domesticated cats and glass on buildings as being very big bird. Um, mortality events. Most of the offshore wind, I think, is about uh, putting these in places where you're going to minimize bird migratory pathways that have to work around them, right, for instance. So, um, uh, and, and then whales, for instance, are one where uh, a lot of the, some of the problems with other types of offshore wind are mitigated by the fact that these are floating. So a lot of the problems with whales have actually been generated by monopile fix because they require pile driving. But with floating, you actually just pull the turbine into place and hook it up to the mooring. So there are actually some potential benefits. You also don't propagate noise and vibration down into the seabed in the same way, you know, with a floating unit that can move with uh, a little bit of the watch circle around. So, you know, most of my conversations on this have been about, you know, birds, uh, especially the Biodiversity Research Institute has been a great partner in trying to understand that one. Thank you. We can save the save the rest for the end. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, we'll see if this works, but I, I just wanted to bring up, you know, one of these ecosystem effects um, and maybe I'll just mute this, uh, but this is a, a tidal gen unit in Quebec uh, so that you'll you see this right here. What's kind of cool about this is they're looking at turns um, and those turns are flying above the water. There's turbulence that you can sort of see in the lee uh, of the turbine. And um, what you're seeing here are the red arrows that show the current speed around there. Um, it's generating turbulence. That turbulence um, essentially creates clockwise and counterclockwise rotations of water off of the units. Um, where it is upwelling, it is red. That means water is coming from the bottom to the surface and bringing a lot of food to the surface. And so one of our you know, ecosystem effects, and, and what's kind of cool about this technology is that you can actually track individual birds, and then you can actually track those individual turns as they go into the water in areas where food is, is, is coming to the surface, right? So you can actually see that below water effects may be connected with above water effects, right? And so that that question of how I would spend my $100 would actually be about trying to think of these systems as, as holistic, that there could be below water effects that change food resources for gulls, for instance, or herring gulls. And even within birds and bird populations, um, you know, they're going to be different species that uh, that are more or less susceptible, right? So I think a lot of a lot of alcids, right? For instance, like puffins are very unlikely to be affected by wind turbines at all because they fly very close to the surface and forage in a fundamentally different way than herring gulls. Thank you. 
So if I had my hundred dollars, a lot of it would be spent on trying to think of this play, think of it as a, a whole ecosystem impact, for instance. Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, what I was showing you before, which with which is remote sensing, so that was with a drone being flown above there with certain sensors that can detect water movement. Um, and then we model if the water is moving cyclonically or anticyclonically, whether the water is going to flow to the surface. So we need ways of remotely sensing these areas because we're not going to be able to sort of just drag a net underneath the wind turbine, right? Because uh, um, there's a lot more structure in the water. So one of these uh, devices is called Didson. Um, and that's where you send an acoustic beam down into the water. So many of you are probably familiar with fish finders. Um, there are very, very advanced fish finders called Didson, where you can actually see the image of the fish actually swimming underneath there. So these are um, some of the technology that we're going to be interested in looking at what we call fisheries aggregation devices. Um, anything you put in the water that's floating that creates shade, many of us know this on docks, are going to attract fish underneath them. Um, so that's certainly one of the technologies we'll be using to, to try to monitor that. Um, another piece of, uh, of, of um, I won't say impact, but certainly something that we have to be really cognizant of is the cable. And one of my big lessons you know, from having done this for a while at this point is it's all about the cable. And this is the proposed cable route that you're seeing through Monhegan Island. Um, and so if you're not familiar with the area in general, here's Monhegan Island where my cursor is. Here's the test site where the 11.4 megawatt unit would go in. This is a survey with multi-beam, so using acoustics survey methods to look for sand and mud that where, uh, where you could bury the cable and um, keep it six feet underneath. Um, and then it would come into Booth Bay. Each of these areas is a grab sample that we did concurrent with the survey to characterize the, the bottom water and the sediment, but certainly figuring out where you can put the, the, uh, the cable is such a huge part of, uh, of all of this. This is an example of the maps. Uh, there's some incredible data that's been generated over here, but uh, this is the cable and habitat mapping to avoid hard bottom. Uh, so what you're seeing here is uh, essentially a, what's called a bathymetric hill shade. So where you see dark areas is where you see a lot of slope. Um, we run the survey through and we look for areas with not a lot of slope uh, um, in this case. Um, and we look for what's called backscatter intensity. So when backscatter intensity is high, that means the signal you sent down reaches back to the acoustic unit very, very quickly. And that tells us that it's hard rock down there. Uh, and where you see that blue area is where you start to see um, that the backscatter actually comes back very slowly. Um, and so we know we have sediment. And so this is the kind of refining that folks are doing to, to try to find areas where these can, um, can be buried um, completely. A lot of research on fisheries coexistence. I think this is a really important for one for me. I've had a, a graduate student living out on Monhegan Island for both the, the fall and the spring, which is the peak of the their lobster um, season. And you know, we're what we're really interested in in asking is how close can can guys fish to these? What is the actual excluded area? Can people fish within these pie wedges? Um, that's certainly a, a really big question, but of, of fishing within the mooring line triangles. Um, so this is one of our, our big questions. Particularly, we want to understand what about gear entanglement? So for mobile gear fishermen, there's going to be you know, interactions in places that you can't fish. The question is, uh, we have a lobster fishery that's a fixed gear fishery. Um, they should be able to, and they will be able to fish a lot closer to these, but the question is how close uh, and how much. So this is one example, the westernmost rough offshore wind. It's, it's got the cleanest example of another lobster fishery that is occurring within the westernmost rough uh, offshore wind in the UK. Um, this is where this, uh, if you're familiar with Leeds, Sheffield, Hull, this is where that offshore wind unit is. This is where the offshore uh, this is all the turbines that are there. Um, this also just gives you a sense of where Tunsall is. Um, and here's London um, way to the south. Uh, these are surveys that they did for European and the European lobster fishery. Um, and this is one of the more important examples for us. And you know, for the most part, they see that um, this was a coexistence collaborative. So they actually did the survey with the lobster industry, which is what we're doing here in Maine. 
Um, and uh, the size distribution and the, the catch rates of commercially important lobster, in this case, Homarus gamarus instead of Homarus americanus, um, and they generally found that there's no difference in landings and catch per unit effort inside and outside the turbine. That is not to say that there's no, you know, no impact, but generally the, the data suggests that um, there isn't a, an extreme negative reaction in terms of the catch rates. Again, it's you, you have to be careful when you take one example from Europe and try to bring it over here. So we have to do our own careful work um, in the future. This is the work we're doing right now where we've uh, completed a pre-deployment monitoring out at Monhegan and we'll repeat it again later. Uh, student Everett Rajowski in our lab is uh, uh, is performing that survey. Um, and uh, uh, one of the ways that we think we can reduce the impact with fishing is to actually change the way these are moored um, underneath the water. And these are sort of the two ways right now, what we call catenary hybrid and a semi-taut system. Um, I'll just go over the first one because it's the most common. It's the one I showed you before in High Wind Scotland, catenary hybrid. That's where you have a turbine. There's chain all the way down the bottom. The chain lays in a scope all the way down to a drag embedment anchor. Um, and these are all steel chain links. Each of those steel chain links is about three feet tall. Uh, they're very, very heavy. Um, very large, um, you know, it, it's been certainly brought up before, like if we're going to have issues with North Atlantic right whale and the lobster fishery, how are we going to be, you know, mooring these to the bottom? These are not really entanglements as much as their structures. That's the catenary hybrid model. And these have long scopes on the end of them. Um, what appears to be the future of this technology is something called synthetic rope or a semi-taut design. And that's where you essentially have very, very, very large diameter ropes that uh, that are connected to the bottom. And the advantage of these systems is that the scope is a lot shorter. Um, so these, uh, the distance between the drag embedment anchor and the turbines are quite a bit shorter. So the watch circle around the turbine is a lot shorter. Um, but there's much more of the infrastructure sort of off the bottom because these are semi-taut. Um, these are actually tight systems that keep the turbine. Uh, in place. And so the future of mooring these systems is important because I think you'll have a lot more space between the turbine watch circles under the semi-taut uh, um, design than you will with the catenary hybrid. And that's certainly one of the, the ways that they're thinking of trying to reduce impact to mobile gear fishermen in this case. Um, this is our study design. We have a control site in a place called Booten's Reach off of Monhegan. This is where the test site is. And in fact, this is where the three mooring uh, drag embedment anchors would go for the Monhegan site. Um, we know that there's a huge difference in catch in terms of legal, uh, legal number of lobsters caught per unit of effort, in this case, traps per soak time. Um, that happen in the test and control site. And uh, and not to go into too much detail, but this is generally what we're trying to do is, is characterize how much, how many legal lobsters are guys catching in this test site, in this control group, and then how much do they catch over time. Most of the Monhegan fishing really takes place in October when, um, uh, when trap day begins in the fall and um, fishing generally gets uh, uh, a little bit worse after that, obviously, and moving into the winter and lobsters are moving a little bit further offshore. Um, I just had a couple more interesting examples to think about, but this is a North Sea example that just got announced, I think, two weeks ago, where Amazon is uh, uh, funding an effort to use a North Sea uh, project called Weir and Wind. Um, North Sea farmers would actually grow kelp in between the, the structures. So if you can't drag, uh, for instance, or use mobile gear, um, you know, the question is, is there community benefits to, uh, to fishermen interest, interested in aquaculture? This is one model that's out there. Certainly um, uh, that is actually, you know, not gonna be for everyone and there's gonna be issues with that too, but this is a, another interesting um, example of what they call co-location where you might co-locate aquaculture and um, floating offshore wind. In this case, this is fixed monopile wind. You know, at the end of the day, we're going to need really, really good remote sensing because as we move offshore, it's a challenging environment. We're going to need echo sounders for fish. We're going to need echo sounders for bats. We're going to need radar for birds. We're going to need cameras and passive acoustic detectors that listen for songbirds. Um, and we're going to need what are called VEMCO or acoustic, um, both what we call passive and active acoustics for, for fish. And 
So I just want to underscore there's a lot of technology development just on the sensing side to try to understand the interactions in these environments. This is an example of a radar image from Monhegan. We deployed a radar at the very southern edge of Monhegan and looked out at the site. Each one of these red dots is a, an example of a bird pathway moving through the area. Gives you another sense. This is where the radar was. This is where the site is. And so these are the uh, vertical band gets you the flight heights of incoming uh, targets. And then you have a horizontal uh, oriented radar that covers a, a wider swath in a um, limited number of depth bands or not depth, but rather um, height bands. Most of the targets are flying very high. So you can see that uh, you know about 100 meters is the uh, height of these turbines. Most of our, especially migratory species, are flying at 400 meters, for instance, right? But we'll have to be looking at this. There's a huge, huge difference between the fall migration at about 121,000 total targets to, uh, to winter, right, where you get 12,000 targets. So um, seasonality, a really big thing that we're characterizing too. Um, nano tags. Uh, this is one of the the, the things that were uh, um, proposed for Monhegan. So tagging birds with very very small nano tags, and then there's a a system of modus uh, radio transceivers that pick up those tags and track those birds um, uh, over the Gulf of Maine. That's going to be a really cool tool because we're going to get individual level bird pathways from that uh, from that information on bigger scales, which is going to be really important because. As I said, you know, we're trying to, I don't know, crawl before we walk, walk before we jog, jog before we run. And when we run, which is a commercial scale, you know, uh, a farm, if, if we ever get that far, it's going to be really important to, to cite these well. Um, I'm going to, uh, this is how we are uh, looking at bats. These are what are uh, bat echo sounders. Um, these are the bats that we've seen offshore, big brown bats and silver haired bats. Um, we know that they are uh, big time, at, you know, right before uh, um, sunrise and uh, right after sunset. So I'll skip some of this because I, I answered some of these questions already, but um, we, uh, we definitely have been really interested in over time of actually looking at behavior of birds around these turbines. Here's the Castine turbine. I hopefully you'll be able to see this, but if you notice... Uh, this is a video of a bird passing uh, uh, by one of these turbines. Actually, when we went to U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they said we were one of the first wind projects to ever show them directly video of birds interacting with turbines. Um, this is a really interesting one. This is going to be sort of hard for people to see, but it's a really interesting example. This is a cormorant that actually, um, I'll, I'll just do this one more time. If you look right here where my cursor is, there's a bird right here. It's sort of hard to see. Uh, when I hit play, you're going to see that bird move toward the turbine and actually perch on the um, security camera or one of our webcams that was out there. Uh, we ended up, you know, as soon as we saw that, we went and put a lot of bird deterrent uh, over in that area. Um, but it was the same cormorant who came for uh, a couple of days um, coming to the, the same area. So it's actually the same cormorant, in this case, flying from the right of your screen to the left of your screen and, and moving towards those perching areas. So we, we learned quite a bit in the Castine, even though it's only a, a one eight scale turbine. So Suzanne, rather than any more, you know, uh, videos, um, maybe I'll take a pause here uh, and see if I can maybe answer some more questions before we hit one o'clock. Yes, there are so many. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, the next one that came up was um, tables are laid for internet and mining. Do they have the same permitting constraints as these cables? Yeah, um, so we have quite a bit number of cables along the coast of Maine, uh, you know, Swans Island, Idaho, uh, um, the Vinyl Haven cables. So this is not the first rodeo with when it comes to cables, but this is a federally supported project. And so, or, um, you know, the Department of Energy is a, is a partner or BOEM is a, a partner. And so those, so those are federal um, acts. So they, there is quite a bit of permitting on this. And then I think that um, over the years, um, providing power to a place like Vinyl Haven has been far less controversial or contentious than offshore wind. And so that's really put a spotlight on cables related to offshore wind. That's that's quite a bit different than than some of the other um, uh, cable uh, uh, laying that you that the questioner was referencing. Mm 
Another cable question. What thinking is there about cable redundancy? Redundancy within cables seems straightforward, but what about different routes to land for security against accidents and or attacks? Yeah, so um, one thing that I've discovered, and again, I'm an oceanographer, so you'll have to take what I say with a grain of salt, but is that probably one of the most expensive components of these projects are the cable. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, they are armored, they are very, very, you know, they're more like this, right? So you can think of them more, almost more like a structure than uh, than a, an extension cord per se, right? So, and then they can have substructures or, uh, um, you know, substations in between. And, and the reason I say that is because um, there's not a lot of redundancy. I mean, there's redundancy within the cable, but there, I haven't really seen a lot of discussions of, you know, well, while you're laying the cable, lay another one or something, right? That, yeah, uh, um, because it's just such an expensive part of uh, of doing this. And and also, every time we were thinking of a different cable route, that required a very very expensive survey, right? To uh, to find a different route. Um, yeah, I, I, I've learned a lot about cables uh, over these like last 13 years, and it, it's just one of the most fundamental pieces of all of these projects. Um, next one, is there a concern about monarch migration? Yeah, um, so we don't typically think of, uh, um, you know, in our consultations with the agencies that I, you know, mentioned in one of those slides, um, there is not a lot of data um, that demonstrates that there's um, collision with uh, with with butterflies or really insects writ large that uh, that is a concern on a population level. So I have never really seen anything like that. Um, in particular, certainly moving over offshore waters, right? Um, uh, the way that that some of these uh, you know where these would be placed. Um, will any turbines be visible from the mainland shore? If so, in what regions of the main coastline? Um, so the main research array certainly will not be at 30 nautical miles off of uh, Portland, um, but Monhegan certainly will be, right? So at a, if, if that turbine moves in at 11.4 megawatts, it'll be visible. And so they've been a lot of visual uh, models, you know, to show people what it will look like from the southern end of uh, end of Monhegan. Um, but I think that, from what I can understand, uh, if that project moves forward, that would be the only visible. Um, but I, and I should say, right, there is a moratorium uh, on um, offshore wind in state waters, right, as part of that agreement um, from last year. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, with all the cables involved. A uh, whale entanglement immediately comes to mind. How is entanglement being addressed? Yeah, so that I think that's why I wanted to stress that there's no bending, there's no uh, looping in the cables, right? And that's why the the uh, synthetic mooring are are semi taut or the catenary chains are three feet apiece and impossible to move. So, from the the consultations that we've had, there's really the only uh, the only consultation I've had that talks about entanglement, right, would be if fishing gear gets entangled in the more in the mooring substructure, right, for instance, right. So that's one of the the gear notification uh, discussions that are um, that are going on is if is it possible to have lobster gear get entangled in the subsea mooring, for instance, right. So I think that's that's a question that's that's open, but these cables that I'm describing are not something that will like loop around. In fact, they they've got these great um, underwater models of humpback whales moving, you know, through a three dimensional sort of video game space of what they would look like compared to the offshore wind structures they're proposing in California. And they're the whales are quite small actually compared to the substructure. Okay, it looks like we have two more. Um... Are areas being selected to avoid bird migration? What methods are being proposed in your permits to minimize, mitigate for impacts to birds? Is this is the state funding this project or is it private? Um, so let there's a bunch of questions there. Um, uh, but certainly they, for instance, the main research array was chosen because it is an area of relatively low fishing and rel relatively low wildlife use, right? So um, certainly bird migra migratory paths are, are taken into account when they are when they are citing these. Um, the main, uh, all of these projects en end up getting constructed by a developer um, and that developer has a power purchase agreement with, with ratepayers. payers 
Um, so these are not the, the state is not funding the the main research array, for instance, right? Uh, um, you know that that project. So a developer will will do that project. So I hope I think I hit those, Suzanne. Um, yes. Um, and the last one. What is the unit cost per megawatt for wind power, and how does that compare to other energy sources? Also, compare costs to using existing fossil fuel power plants with enhanced pollution controls to capture and recycle uncombusted hydrocarbons at the source. Yeah, so the, the question is referring to CCS or carbon capture and storage, um, uh, and you know, and sometimes maybe the idea of clean coal. Um, so, I, and I and I I have to say that I'm I'm not going to delve into the energy prices. I I wish I could answer your question more straightforward, but at least what I've been discussing right now are certainly these are R and D or research uh, developments, right? So comparing the current cost to uh, power that's been around for decades, right? And that certain subsidies as well, right? Is a, a apples to orange oranges comparison. And I, I, I'm just not uh, qualified to, to really you know, make those um, comparisons directly. Amy, and one more came in and it looks like we're not quite at one. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, this one says for people who are skeptical about these wind farms in this area, is there an easy to read digestible resource that can be shared with them to answer these types of common questions? Yeah, I you know, resources that I found useful are MCV, the main conservation voters, uh, at, um, and their group has, which is sort of a conglomeration of a lot of NGOs that have been thinking hard about this for a while. They've had some some recorded seminar series that I think are really useful. Um, and they've compiled uh, quite a bit on this. Uh, they also sort of keep up to date with legislation and with activities that are happening in this space. Um, so I, I have found the main conservation voters and the resources there, you know, pretty useful. And I, and I should say I'm not a, um, you know, I've worked on this a long time. I'm really, really interested in climate solutions rather than documenting climate collapses of fisheries and ecosystems and things like that that have that have happened. But you know, there is no silver bullet here, right? Like, I think there's complexities in these developments that, you know, I think a, a, a couple of your questioners have, that have brought up that I, I completely respect, you know, the, um, the the complexities here and that there's there's really no silver bullet with this, but we have to bring this to ground, which is to say, like, is this worth doing and will it mitigate carbon emissions in the long run? Yes, 